One, two, three, and we are live. Welcome everybody to another episode of These Get Degrees. I'm here today with my good friend and UMass Amherst student, Jackson Haley. Say hello to the folks. What's going on? All right, Jackson, well, we're here today. We're going to talk about just a little bit about your time at Amherst. You have never transferred. You've been here all four years. Um, so you want to talk a little bit about your experience going to college. Uh, was Amherst your first choice? Your family's background? Um, they want you to go to college growing up? Uh, yeah, sure. So I guess um, I guess I'll just start like back in high school, like what I kind of thought about college and then like talk about why I decided to come here and then maybe I'll transition into what my experience has been like. So I guess back in like high school, I didn't really think about going to college that much, um, kind of until my senior year, to be honest. Um, I know a lot of people are planning it out super far in advance. Like they have they have this whole schedule where they're going to go, where they're going to apply, what they're going to do. But m- my experience, I was just kind of like going with the flow <laughs> a little bit. I mean, I knew I wanted to go to college and I kind of, the way I looked at it was that it was something I just had to do as like part of my adult life. I it wasn't needed- something, like it wasn't something that you felt was, you weren't necessarily all about college, but you knew that you had to go. Yeah, I kind of, yeah, I kind of just felt like it was something I would benefit from in the long run, even though I was pretty unsure of what I wanted to do and where I wanted to go. Um, I did kind of want to go to the University of Maryland just because I was born in Baltimore and I had felt like a strong connection there. Um, And I did get in, but I didn't actually end up going there because I liked UMass. Um, The price of the school was really good. And I thought I'd get a great experience going here. UMass, um, number one, potty yeah. school. Yeah, UMass is great. Um, it's nice being out in Western Mass, but... Mm. In the middle yeah, of so, nowhere. Yeah. yeah, in the middle of nowhere. But, I mean, it's cool. It's like its own little city. And I did, I did know I wanted to go somewhere big, so a lot of the schools I applied to were bigger schools with large student populations just because I wanted to experience a lot of different things and meet tons of new people as opposed to kind of having the same experience as high school where there's just like a small confined amount of people and you know pretty much everyone maybe there's a couple people you don't know but I mean in like our graduating class I'd say I know almost everyone's name not anymore but at the time definitely yeah and I think again we are from a group of friends in high school that we were more involved we weren't as clicky um as some groups tend to be in high school. I mean, our schools, I'd say, like, overall, we're very, like, good group of friends, like, just as a, like, class. It's, like, no one was really, like, hating on, like, a certain particular group. We pretty much got to, like, got along with everyone, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, we were pretty open to, like, hanging out with whoever or whatnot. I mean, we had some beefs, but But. it was all good fun, you know? (laughs) But, yeah, I mean, like... So, yeah, that was, like, kind of why I decided to come out to UMass in particular. Um, And I was undecided my freshman year. I thought I wanted to do, like, business um, or finance. You want to be Jordan Uh, Belfort, dude? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I mean, like, I didn't know anything about it, but I had, like, I had kind of, like, a a general idea that I wanted to do something business-related. I had no idea what, and... I came in undecided, and then, yeah, my first couple semesters, I just didn't really, like, I was taking a lot of gen ed courses, which didn't, I thought would interest me, but really didn't, and I wasn't having a great time with them, so I kind of just paid less attention to my schoolwork, and I was kind of just doing my own thing, Um, and then my, probably my sophomore year, like the first semester or so, um... I went to the investment club because a kid who I had sat next to in one of my public policy courses said, hey, man, you, like, sound like you'd be interested in, like, investing. And I was like, yeah, man, that sounds really cool. Like, he's like, go to the investment club. It's in this room at this time. And I said, all right, dude, that sounds sweet. I'll go. I got nothing better to do. (laughs) So uh, I actually You're like, are there going to be girls there, dude? Yeah. going to be chicks, right? Yeah, yeah. So I walked down there, um, and I actually met my current roommate on the walk to investment club because I recognized him. He was on my floor, like across the. There's like a two sides of the floor divided by a common room, 
so you'd see the kids in the bathroom or whatever, but I mean, we didn't like, I didn't see this kid that I'm rooming with now all the time, but I ended up seeing him on the walk and I was like, Hey, you going to the investment club? And he's like, yeah, I was like, word. So am I. So that was kind of, uh, my first foray into like figuring out like what I want to do with my life and whatnot. And, um, yeah, after that, I just, uh, I kind of just decided that I was really interested in investing, and that's kind of like where I've positioned myself so far in my college career. You fell in love with the money. <laughs> Not the money. I don't. It's really interesting. To see, like I like doing research and uh, reading. And so you're a big nerd. Like, yeah, I mean, I guess so, but I don't know. I'm trying to read a lot more than I have throughout my college career. I kind of lost. I lost a little bit of that because I've been more paying attention to, like, current events and what's going on in the news rather than, like, actually sitting down and reading a book and also with, like, social media and all that. It's, like, it's hard <laughs> to sit down and read a couple hundred pages. Rather read some memes than some good yeah, books. Yeah. It's way easier scrolling through Instagram, but, yeah. <laughs> but can we talk about – so your dad, he went to an Ivy League school, correct? Um, yeah. And how does that play into choosing where you wanted to go to school? Did he want you – did he have – did he see you doing big things? Um, my dad – uh, he played college football at Marist and he always wanted me to do like sports in college and that kind of stuff. And he always thought Marist was the greatest college of all time. Shout out if you are a Marist Red Fox, but it's in Poughkeepsie, New York and it's a liberal arts school and it's where serial killers go to hide. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. I've so, heard about that. Yeah. It's not really, um, I wouldn't, I mean, it's kind of like being in the middle of nowhere in Amherst, but it's in New York and not really a place that I'd like to be, but I wonder if the weather's worse than it is here. I, I would imagine, but yeah. So your your dad, um, he went to Ivy League school. He played rugby, correct? Yeah. So yeah. So I mean, he didn't really influence me at all, like deciding where I wanted to go. Like I had a lot of freedom. I know, like some kids were like, my parents wanted me to go to Ivy League school, and they like made me do all this SAT prep and all that. My parents were never really like that. They were like. Yeah, if it's something you think, like, I think they wanted me to go to college, but I also did too. So it wasn't like there was no problems with that. It wasn't like if I had been like, oh, I want to like drop out and like start a tech company, they'd be like, no. But I think they probably did want me to go to school. And I mean, there wasn't really like any influence. Again, like I wasn't, I wasn't one of those kids that was like thinking about it way ahead of time. I was kind of just going with the flow. So if I had wanted to go to like an Ivy League school, I probably would have had to do more preparation and like, I don't know, maybe yep. studied more for the SATs <laughs> and like been way more involved in, well, in it, high school. Because I mean, I only did sports. I didn't really get involved too many other ways. It's crazy to think that um, there was that kid who was part of one of the school shootings and he was doing all the th like good um stuff for gun prevention and um, making gun laws harder and stricter. And he got into Harvard and uh, the masses were complaining that his SAT scores weren't high enough and he shouldn't be allowed to go to Harvard. And it's crazy to think that someone that never been to Harvard can say you are not in, in, like intelligent enough to be allowed to go there because your SAT scores, it's like, do my SAT scores really tell you how smart I am? Yeah. It's like, You've met some really, there are some incredibly talented, intelligent people here at uh, UMass Amherst, and especially in the Eisenberg School, a lot, a lot of your roommates there that way. Um, and I don't think that college, the problem with college is in Ivy League, it's like your dad, would you say he is like one of the most intelligent people that you've ever met in your life? Yeah, probably. But it's I like, so. he went to what Ivy League school? He went to Dartmouth. Dartmouth. And Dartmouth... Was that, where is he, is he from here originally, or is he from Maryland, too? Well, he was born in Georgia, but he grew up in Baltimore, in Baltimore. like, outside Baltimore a little bit. Um, and, yeah, he went to Dartmouth. What's his major? Uh, geography, I geography. believe. Yeah. What does he do now? He works, like, he does, like, business, world business trade. Yeah, he does, um, he does sourcing for a bath and body works type company they do like lotions and stuff so he's a vice president of sourcing there so he does a lot of uh work with their suppliers in different countries and visits all the different factories and all that kind of stuff um yeah so that's what he does there but yeah so yeah he went to dartmouth and i mean i i guess they didn't really like i, I thought it would be kind of cool to go there but i didn't really orient myself that way um, well, the crazy thing, too, you realize, um, we've touched on this in other episodes, that 
Like once you get out of high school, if you're not kind of like a 4.0 student, you, you can't really like go to the top, top schools. But most schools, there are enough schools now in in the country that you can pretty much get in somewhere. Yeah. Regardless of your GPA, you can have like a 2.0, still get into some schools, such like at SNU and stuff. But Or you can go to community college. But the secret about college is once you're in college and you get good grades in college, you can transfer anywhere. Yeah. I don't know. It might be a little more difficult to get into, like, Ivy League, but the fact that I went to college, um, my senior year of high school, I got, like, a 3.5, but my overall GPA was, like, a 2.8. Um, yeah. And then I ended up going to SNU, and I was able to transfer to University of Arkansas. University of Arkansas. <laughs> University of Arkansas. They let you in with a 2.0. does not matter how many credits you have. If it's you're under 20 credits, you need to then send your high school transcript. But other than that... They'll instantly accept you. It's like That's you for transfer students. For transfer students, it just boom. It's kind of like how here in Massachusetts they do this thing. If you go to community college and you have a two five, um, it's called, what is it? Uh, mass. Yeah, mass transfer. Mass tra- I, I was gonna say it's the same way here because I know the incoming uh, class of freshmen for next year, the average GPA was like above 4.0, which is, I mean, the scales are kind of arbitrary at this point because now you can have like a 6.0. I don't know how they do it and weight it across all these. It's different. like, I mean, all AP I classes. It, was, it should just be like straight 4.0 the way it's done in college, like standardized across high schools. But okay. some of them with like these AP credits, like you can have like a 6.0 coming in school. So the average for UMass is a lot higher for new students than it is for transfer students because a lot of transfer students can get in with well, like less than a 3 You think. need a minimum of a 2-7 at least to transfer in. So, so that's, yeah, that's like way, like if you apply here with a 2-7, you probably won't get in. I mean, unless you have some crazy stuff on your resume, but. No, like, but with their transfer stuff, if your minimum isn't even below 2-7, they won't let you in at all. Like you're instantly denied. So UMass does the do. threshold. Yeah. UMass does do a really good job, I think, of keeping the intelligence level of their students pretty 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 high they want some yeah. uh, i mean that's paper intelligence yeah so it's super subjective but yeah but um the point being that if you go to one of these big like this i mean umass amherst was is probably the best public university in massachusetts non-ivy league i would say this is the flagship program of yeah, there are yeah. four umasses but um because they have their eyes the thing you realize too is most schools are very like regardless of how good a school is it can have an incredible program so here the eisenberg school of business is one of the best business programs in all like all the con like all yeah all the country right yeah i mean um i know like the online mba program is like number one or two ranked but i don't really know how that stacks up like how many online mba programs there are the business school itself is like, I forget. I think it's like, all right, well, I know I just read uh, a good article in the Boston Globe about how UMass is trying to rebrand itself as this like premier academic public school. And we're ranked somewhere around 20th for public institutions in the United States, which is pretty decent. Um, I wouldn't consider it like a lead. I is, would like, what they're trying to become, but I would say Eisenberg's pretty like well ranked. I think I would say after being at like University of Arkansas, being at SNU, being at UMass Boston, you can. There's definitely a sense at on this campus, and just having toured a bunch of like when I was in Utah for high school, like went to University of Utah, uh, checked that school out. There's something about this campus that it just. It, and like the teachers, the professors, it's a very like incredible school, I think. And this is yeah. definitely my, I, this is one of the schools like I wish I went here all four years. I really enjoy my time here, yeah. which is weird to something um, that like I noticed in literally like two weeks of being here. I, I think that UMass is cool because it kind of scoops up a lot of those really smart kids that can't afford to go to those elite private colleges and they end up at a place like this which is a lot cheaper, but it's also really good academically. And, I mean, that student body of people that are all super intelligent kind of makes the school 
like a better place to be and the discussion's better in classes and whatnot. I mean, it, it does, it does differ for like different majors, and different schools. Well, that's like, like if you there go, are some people that come here just to party. But. Exactly. Well, that we have like kids in high school that you can come here for like the certification in like turf management. So they'll let, they'll let those kids in. They like with a two five, they just need people to fill out those classes. So you come yeah. for two years, get your turf management and get to have your fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, Hey, maybe that's smarter than getting a business degree and getting yeah, like a yeah. two five. I mean, it might be, I mean, I mean, I know there's a couple kids from our school that did that program, and I've heard it's, like, pretty decent. Well, that Plus, you're only going to school for two years, so, like, you're out working less debt, especially if you're getting loans for the whole thing, so. Exactly. And I think that goes back to how, like, Universe Arkansas has an incredible engineering program. I know the engineering program here is pretty good. It's like Regis College has, like, a really good nursing program, but if you're not going for nursing, it's, there's yeah. no point. So you need to look at schools more as – hey, what is this program? What do I want to do? And, like, UMass is a good school, too, in, like, your case. Like, you didn't even know what you wanted to do. Yeah. And you were able – and they have a bunch of good programs. I say all the programs mm-hmm. here are pretty good. But if you went to, like, a, I don't know, a small – like, you went to SNU. SNU, has like, tries to be revolutionary with, like, their business stuff because they have all the online money. But yeah. but it's, like, you go to SNU and you're, like, okay, um, all these kids – and I think that is the biggest difference between all the different colleges is, like, the type of discussions in class – so, uh, like, a small school that's letting in, like, 90% to, like, 70% of, like, people that submit to go, um, you're going to have a lot less people. Like, so here at UMass, you'll have kids that, you know, could have gone to the Ivy League schools. They maybe just were a little bit too expensive. So, you're going to have those kids, especially in the honors programs and that kind of stuff. Whereas, like, people, at, like, the smartest person at, like, a SNU probably wasn't going to get into a Ivy League school. Yeah. That I'd, say, I'd say a good way to describe the school as far as, like, where it lays on a scale comparatively to all the other co- colleges in the United States is, like, when looked at, like, on the grand scale, it's, like, probably upper mid-tier, but for public schools, it's probably more in that upper tier. Like, it probably bumps into one of the better public schools. And you can it's use... probably the best public school in Massachusetts, I'd say. And then, I mean... Probably in all of New England. Massachusetts does really have good public education as well, so having a good public college education is... Uh, or, like, university, <laughs> rather, is pretty pretty solid i'd say well university of arkansas right so arkansas is 49th in the country in public schools um now that more people like uh walmart's down there um tyson chicken um uh, lots of big transportation companies so they have a lot of now trans like transplants people from like new england all over the country moving down yeah, there yeah. so they have a lot of good private schools most private schools in any country are going to be pretty good um but so their public schools are 49 which means they're they're one of the worst. Yeah. And but Massachusetts, we are usually number one or number two, and that's something I was really able to notice. So like in Massachusetts, I'd say I was like you know a a, a B level student, and then I lived in eighth grade. I went from public schools here to public schools in Delaware, and you know there's the standardized testing that you do, and I took the standardized test in Delaware, and I was literally like the 99 percentile. Yeah. And then it's like you go to and it's something people from Massachusetts, they really, um, when they go somewhere else that's not uh, in Massachusetts, people like you'll talk to people from here, go to school down like the Carolinas or somewhere warm, and they'll come back to Massachusetts and they'll be like, man, I really like it here just because the people that you meet are like, it's, we we're talking to a bunch of people that are intelligent and learned to, like school well, like it's something you can actually notice right away. Mm-hmm. It's a very strange thing that. You don't even, like, take into consideration, like, oh, my public school has people that get it. Like, my public school, our public school from high school has people that go and go to Harvard from there. Yeah. And it's, like, that's kind of a big accomplishment. Well, then I have a question. Do you think that, say, like, for example, comparing Massachusetts public schools when you're, like, in your younger years of education, do you think that the people you're talking to were necessarily more dumb or were they just – did they just receive different public educations? Therefore, they weren't as uh, well, I don't want to say groomed, but well prepared to take those standardized tests. It's definitely the second option being, like, it's not like you're having a conversation. I mean, there are some places in Arkansas, like in the middle of nowhere, some yeah. places where it's like, oh, okay, like, obviously, 
they don't read and write so good kind of thing. But like, um, it's like in eighth grade, like all my friends from Delaware, like I think like the intelligent ones that were, that could, would have done just fine in um, Massachusetts schools. I just kind of like how in Massachusetts, like in our public schools, we did all like the research papers and writing the essays. And then you get to college and you're like, it feels like I'm just doing high school class where a lot of schools in parts of the country, they aren't really doing that stuff. So getting to the college for them is a bigger jump. Mm, uh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. But obviously, um, I, then when I went to Utah, I went to uh, Juan Diego, which is like one of the top Catholic schools in the country. Um, they filmed like a lot of movies there. High School Musical being one of them. Shout out my boy, ZF. Um, but yeah, but he, uh, but so like there, obviously those people were like, the school was just as good, if not better than like Plymouth North. Yeah. And then we have like, you know, friends that went to, where did uh, Tim and them go for high, for like middle school? Sacred Heart. Sacred Heart. It's like, we know people at the Sacred Heart. It's not yeah. like... I mean, I don't think it's like... I wouldn't really consider it like an elite brand. But, like, my dad went to Zavarian in high school. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So, like, Zaver- like we have Zavarian. We have friends that went to BC. Yeah. Uh, there's obviously a big jump. And then we, like, know girls that went to, like, Notre Dame and stuff. Yeah. Like, even our private high schools here are very, very good. And yeah. they, like, line you up for good colleges. I think... I mean, those types of places, I think, are just more breeding grounds for upper education because they they are there's a lot more focus on preparation of well, students for things like the sats like that's why you're there though like your yeah. parents are paying money for you to go there so you can go yeah, to a good mean, school it is a preparatory school so yeah <laughs> that does make sense but yeah i feel i mean they do do a good job and i think that. that's what i've now realized um just like after all my different experiences all over the country and being in different schools is like intelligent people are always intelligent it doesn't really matter where you put them but a lot does go into the preparation and dumbing down people or making them intelligent like Mm -hmm. i don't think like obviously you're either you're born like naturally good at something you can pick up things quicker but i think if you put people in the right position they will be able to yeah yeah. become you could take a kid out of the worst private school and put them in a I mean, the worst public school, and put him in a good private school, and he could go to Harvard. But he's well, I don't know. Terrible public school, and he's not going to have a future. I think that's. I think you could make that assumption with some people. It definitely depends on the person, but I think like situationally, a lot of people don't have the have the chance to really get into those like upper elite colleges. And, but I think that most of those. But the thing is, like those people that are don't have the chance, don't even want to go to those upper league colleges. Like, obviously, I, I don't think I ever once thought about going to Harvard or, I mean, obviously, growing up, you kind of, like, that's kind of, like, yeah, your dream yeah. or not. But I don't think if I could have, I've, like, worked with people that have been to Harvard. I worked with someone that was a valedictorian of Boston College. And it's just, like, they're just, like, you know, like, my friends. Like, we're all, they're intelligent. Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't talk to them, and I'm, like, whoa. It's, yeah. like, you've done something that I couldn't even imagine. Yeah. I mean, I think I would probably enjoy it. Oh, well, I think because like you get exposure to some really good professors. That's what that's what I realize college is more about. It's the professors that you like. It's again, it's the opportunities that you take from college. It's the connections that you get, yeah. and that's a big thing. Like those professors at those schools are amazing, and like now yeah, that exactly, I wish I was at, was able to be around those kind of professors. Like even when I was at UMass Boston and I was doing theater, all of my professors were acting like working yeah. people in the film industry my um theater design professor he was designing all the sets for everything that's going on here so he was the tv show i'm going to be on coming out next year the society he designed those sets yeah so it's like that is one of the advantages that you got to look at too when you're looking to go to college is like what is your major like do research in the professors like that's like again you watch like all those documentaries all the time and it's like oh um their documentaries on nutrition or stuff and it's like this is a professor at ucla or U- usc it's like these are people that are teaching at these schools and you can go talk to them someone i like is like jordan peterson it's like he was a psychology professor in um canada, canada. so it's like imagine being in his class but it's yeah. also most of the then you like watch those lectures online and it's like kids not even paying attention <laughs> they're like they're showing up late well that's the thing it's like it's so different nowadays i feel like so like if you went to college back and like 60s and the 70s like there's no phones in there and i feel like it really facilitates good discussion because like you don't really have a choice but to listen to the professor and talk but now you can kind of sit on your phone i can see it sometimes in class like professors definitely they want to be super enthusiastic and they want to just like share the wealth knowledge that they've 
gathered throughout their time, and then half the kids in class are just, like, looking at their phones, Snapchatting. It's probably demoralizing. Oh, 100%. Which, is, which is probably plays into part of the reason why I think to some degree probably the overall discussion levels of certain schools have declined over the past couple of years. I I look at it, too. Like, I was always one of those kids. You know what I hate in class is when the teacher has a question and then no one raises their hand. Yeah. And so I was always that kid that was like, I'll just answer the question just because I hate that awkward silence. Like, I might as well just, like, because I want – I, like, enjoy learning and I enjoy conversation. So it's like, okay, I'll just keep engaging. And then that's what you learn um, – once you get to like like UMass, well, then the problem is too. We have like you know the big. It's tough to engage 150 people in a like lecture hall. Yeah. And so it's like that's what's nice about the small classes. As you like move up, especially in your major, the higher level classes, like you actually get to sit there and discuss with the professor. Like I'm in philosophy classes now that have like 10 people. Like it's awesome. Like yeah. you just get to discuss philosophy. Everyone there cares about philosophy. No one's on their phone. It's like. My sister right now is a sophomore in high school, and one of her teachers called, uh, she's an older teacher, and she's been teaching at Plymouth North for over 20 years, and she called my mom to be like, hey, uh, your sis, my sister, Maddie, she has staying after tomorrow, I want to help her get like her grades up, she's staying after for extra credit, whatever, she called my mom, and then she talked to Matt, my sister on the phone, was like, hey, you're going to stay after tomorrow, right? She's like, yeah, and she had a conversation with my mom after, and she's like, yeah, then these new, like, younger generations like these kids don't ever want to get off their phones like i literally like before the start of class i'll have to go take their phone from them and some of them just won't give it to me they're the freshman sophomore kids it's like they're on their phone 24 7 and it's like these new professors like kids like our age they're like now teaching all these kids they're like they just don't care as much and it's because like it's tough to gain their attention and it's like She's like, I think I'm going to retire from teaching soon because, like, I can't do it anymore. It's so hard to want to teach people that don't care yeah. about being taught. And that goes back to the idea that I don't like the fact that we do gen eds in college because it hurts the professor because you have kids in that class that don't want to be there. They just have to be there. And it kills, like, your love of teaching, I'd say, right? Just yeah. being like, okay, I'm a biology professor. I love biology. But I have all these kids that could give a crap about biology coming in. Coming in and like sitting there, being on their phone, sitting on their laptop, not caring. Yeah. It's very tough to give a presentation when no one cares. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I'd say I'm like, I, I'm definitely guilty of this to some degree. Because like when I was a freshman, I was taking like all gen ed courses. And I think that was part of the reason why I didn't like perform as well academically as I probably should have. Because I was in a lot of classes I just didn't really enjoy. The subjects weren't engaging to me. And then everyone else was sitting on their phones. So there wasn't like... It wasn't really that classroom environment that I would have preferred, which is part of the problem with going to a big school, even though I think in the long run, it definitely benefited me, and I, I, I'm i pretty glad I chose to come here, but um, those large classrooms, it is kind of hard to have like engagement from the class just because there's so many people, and you're not like getting to know all the students, which is part of the reason why they do discussions. So you'll have like your two lectures and then you'll have a discussion where it's like less people, um, which is part of what goes into like making a really good class. Cause my, probably my favorite class that I've taken at UMass was this class. Um, it was called, I don't know, it was a public policy course. And, uh, basically there's two lectures a week and then a discussion um, at the end of the week on Friday and we would just go through problems in public policy and like kind of social issues and basically the students would just debate them and discuss whether they thought these things were important like what they think potential solutions could be and there was like 20 students in there and it was just like really cool because there's so many different people that had differing opinions. I mean, I guess like the school tends to lean one way on a lot of like social issues and political issues. Um, and that's just a product of where we are and the type of students that apply here. But um, I mean, it was really cool getting to like, kind of like argue and debate with people on certain topics, like say like gun control or like taxes or like abortion policy. Like those are the types of things that I think are really interesting to hear different opinions on. Oh, especially around here. Um, it's like, it's nice being in a state that is very, um, has both sides of the party. Um, and it's tough. Like some people live in states where it's just like, 
well, even Massachusetts, we always vote blue, but it's, like, nice that there are people here that are on both sides. Yeah. But at the same point, it's nice to be in a class that you want to be in because you're engaged. It's kind of like, I understand why, like, when I'm watching, like, a Jordan Peterson, his lecture online, I'm engaged because I'm voluntarily choosing to watch it. Whereas, like, maybe that kid had to take psychology and he doesn't even care. I like, yeah. so I understand why. Like, usually when you want to learn something, you're going to put, like, all of your attention to it. But when someone forces you to take a class, even if you find the class interesting, maybe you're going to sit there and be like, I don't even want to go. There are classes I have enjoyed that I've still been like, I just don't want to go because I don't want to sit in class. Yeah. But and the more you take classes that you enjoy, when once you find something that you do enjoy learning about, uh, it makes learning. Like, everyone, you're learning something regardless. Like, so say you like sports. You're like, you know, every day you're watching ESPN, you're checking the stats, like you're learning stats and you're literally choosing to learn those stats because you're looking at the screens, you're reading the articles, you're hearing about like you love the Celtics, you're learning about trades that could happen, all that kind of stuff. Like that is learning. You just don't even see it as learning. Like every time you're getting information, it's learning the information. Yeah, that's true. I agree. But it's like also a problem again with most schools now. It's more of a memorizing than learning, and that's why like, I learn stuff when I discuss it. I love having discussions in class. I like the smaller classrooms. I like when I can sit down and talk to the professor. It's because one, the professor, most of these professors have been teaching for a very long time. They've met every kind of student. They've seen like you know every kind of thing, and it's like they know more about the topic than I do. So it's like okay, I'm gonna like talk to them. It's tough in those big lectures too that's what we were saying with the, the Brock about syllabus week, like go meet your professors. I don't know yeah. if you are that kind of student. That's something I've learned later in school is like to go up, introduce myself to professors in the big classes. Is that something you did coming into college or were you kind of like that classic, like, yeah, I'm here for college, but I could kind of give a shit. I just want to party. That's a freshman. And then like, you know, I don't know. I guess it depends on the class. Like, there's some classes I wouldn't introduce myself to professor and other classes I didn't. Do you have any professors that you've met here that, like, you've, like, had, like, a connection with that, you know, like, I don't know? Um, I, w I haven't really, like, had any mentor-type professors that I've, like, sat down with every week and, like, gone out and gotten coffee with. But I've definitely met a lot of people like that. They're Especially from, not like... necessarily professors. From, like, the economics club. That's another thing, too, right? Like, maybe you're not getting that connection from your professors, but you can yeah. go get that stuff from no, yeah. the clubs. And, like, a senior, when you're a freshman, can be have a huge yeah, influence. Yeah, exactly. Just being around people that care about what you care about and have more experience in it is a great way. Yeah. And having those kind of relationships is super beneficial to you down the line because... I mean, even, like, if you're a freshman, like, maybe, like, join a club with the leadership as upperclassmen that have been to college and, like, understand what you're going through, um, and they can really help guide you because I know a lot of people are kind of lost and they don't know what they want to do. Like, for example, like, this is my third semester now as one of the, like, co-presidents of the investment club, and we try and, like, reach out to, like, really young, like, freshmen who are majoring in finance and want to, like, learn about investing, and, like, people from all different majors, too. Like, we have math majors, engineering majors, whatever, um, and we, like, really try and, like, teach them, like, necessary skills for getting jobs, like, at a super young age, because, like, if you're a freshman, like... And you're starting to, like, learn on, like, about all these different types of things, like, how to interview, like, processes work, like, how do I reach out and network with people in the industry? What's my like, resume what, supposed to look what like? What is my resume supposed to look like? Like, all that kind of stuff, like, they do teach you some of that, but it really depends on your major, and some people don't really get exposure to that, or they haven't had exposure to that, so they just go to their classes and then go and sit in their room, and then by the time they're a senior, they realize they haven't really learned how to get a job they and they kind of think that it's just gonna like come to them but that's not really how it works it's like so, you graduate you get your diploma and then there's yeah. a guy like the company like the suit he hands you the contract yeah. he's like you're hired bro he's like yeah. wait that's how it works like no yeah i mean like i didn't know a lot of that stuff at all because i mean i didn't know what i wanted to do and also i like just didn't have any exposure to like interviewing or how to get uh, like, internships, how to, like, how to do that stuff. resume yeah like that kind of stuff was stuff i definitely learned in my first like couple years and i wish i had done it earlier the earlier you can kind of like start to learn that stuff the better off you'll be if you come into college and you come in just like knowing like hey i need to know how to like do a resume i need to be part of something and i say that's like 
how you're in an economics club, but you have not everyone there is an economics major. That's a good thing too, right? So say your major is business, like go be part of things that aren't like, you don't, you can be in the business club, but being clubs or organizations, part of groups that are closely related to what you're learning, Mm. but also that you can branch off because like most people do not work what their major is. It's not like you're going to get a job. Like what is a mathematics like major going to get? You're going to either be a math professor or you're going to like do something with math and it's like though well, there are a lot of things that have to do with math like you yeah. can be an accountant you can be a not every math major is going to be a mathematician yeah exactly <laughs> it's like dude i got the formula bro <laughs> goodwill hunting saw it on the board yeah dude he didn't even I go wish, to... i wish i could do that yeah, yeah. just like I'm see not, a number i'm not good enough at math i know some math majors that are pretty smart but i know a math major was super intelligent and now he works for like uh least like a job. he's like uh what is it like a job hunter like his job is to get you jobs it's like he's a recruiter hunter yeah it's like what is i mean obviously there's numbers involved in that but it's like you really went to that's school for wow, that's way more social i yeah consider it yeah it's like dude you did four years of learning math like all that it's like pain learning nothing but hard skills and your job just entirely retire requires soft skills <laughs> But like math plays a huge part in everything you do. You don't. It's like all these skills that you don't even realize how much they're playing. Like math, um, marketing, sales. You're selling yourself. Like yeah. sales is a skill skill you'll do the rest of your life. It's like you need to know how to talk about yourself to mm. get a job. Yeah. That's what you're doing in an interview setting, especially when you get to these bigger. Like most of the big upper echelon companies that like a lot of people want to work for, like there's those interviews are multi. It's not like one interview you go in. It's not like Step Brothers. They're sitting in the suits. Like, yeah, dude, I like the party. It's like, dude, you yeah, like the party yeah. too? It's like, all right, we got it, dude. It's like, no, you go in. Then you have your first interview. Then you have your second interview, and then like you have a role play. Your third interview, and then yeah. it'll go down like the top. You start with like ten candidates, or work it down to like the final two. Well, one of my interviews was like, it was in New York. It was probably like five hours long, I think, and I met with probably maybe like 10 different people total so we went into the building um one of the women who works at the desk brought us up like introduced us to a couple people and then i was partnered with two people i'd never met before that were also interviewing and they put all three of us in a room and they gave us this sheet with a bunch of um i guess like futuristic problem like moral dilemmas i guess you'd say like something like um what is the problem with having like entirely nothing on the road but driverless cars and they said all right you three you guys should talk to each other for five minutes we'll step out of the room and you decide what your talking points are going to be and then you can kind of like give us your response to one of these questions like one of these prompts um and that was like really weird for me because i've never done anything like that i was like how this isn't an interview like like what the fuck is weird (laughs) this is like a weird like case study type of deal um but i mean i guess they were just assessing like your skills for like working with people because that's what you're getting hired for yeah yeah so like that was like i couldn't have prepared for that type of interview but we went in and we just like talked through it and we like disagreed on some points um and then we kind of came through and we made sure to, like, all have, like, our own talking points that kind of, like, played into what the previous person had said, that we all talked and, like, kind of had, like, a conclusion that we came to and end. It was, like, pretty interesting, um, like, exercise for an interview. And then directly after that, they separated all of us. And then it was a one-on-one where they gave us a packet with, like, a bunch of, like, fake financials and, like, emails between two different people. And it was basically just, like, read through this and give, like, a solution for the client. So they gave me, like, 10 minutes to take notes on the case and, like, read everything. And then they were, like, all right. They just asked me a bunch of questions about it. Like, why? Like, what is, like, wrong with this company financially? Like, blah, 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 blah. Like, whatever. Like, that's not the type of thing. And then the next interview was, like, technical questions. So, like, really job-specific, like, questions where you need to like do a little preparation like maybe know a little bit of math like have a good idea of what's going on current events and then the last one was just entirely like all right tell us about yourself so like that like i didn't know that interviews were like that when i was coming into college like i figured you'd just be in a room with a hiring manager you got a nice suit on and be like all right talk about your resume like 
name some times like you showed leadership like all right like let me uh your grades are pretty good like want to talk about your classes and it would be like that for an hour but it's like it really depends on the type of job you're going for but some of them can be super uh super weird processes but because you got to realize too right it's not like they want an individual that will work well with a team unless you're getting hired for like a position that you are working by yourself most of the jobs you are working for you need to like you're going to be working part of a team and they don't want someone that can just yeah. freaking knows the economics <laughs> like yeah because like, everyone knows that right like they want someone who's like because they could teach you that honestly like you could be like an english major and go into like want to work for like a bank or something like they'll teach you everything you need to know about like finance and all that stuff every j- it, it doesn't like you have to you have to be a certain type of person to be able to talk to people and like be outgoing, like ask good questions, like be like actually a critical thinker and really like want to involve yourself fully in that kind of work. And like, that's what they're looking for in the interview rather than like, all right, does this kid know all these like formulas or whatever you learn? Critical thinkers and problem solvers is really what most companies are looking for. And it's very hard to find good company like if you have that skill like you're going to be a valuable commodity yeah. in the workforce mm-hmm. but at the same point um most like you were saying how when you were doing that interview with you had to work as a team it's like you couldn't prepare for that well you did prepare for that by being president of the economic club like that that's a uh, skill yeah. that that's a skill that you again that you're learning that you're not even realizing you're learning it's like being parts of things and learning to communicate with others and solve problems together that's like a skill that you're doing yeah without even realizing you're doing it yeah that's why it's important to get involved in all those clubs and all that kind of thing because you kind of pick up those skills inherently like i didn't know how to public speak or like present before i got involved in the, like the investment club and like some of the other clubs that i'm involved with on campus um but we do like present like i'm running lessons with a couple other people in front of like sometimes there's like 50 people in there sometimes there's five like it really depends that's but... like more scary presenting to like five people than it is like 50 people because there's like when there's 50 people it's like okay like maybe this one guy isn't paying attention but like when there are five people in the room and you're doing a presentation or something and like they're those five people pretty much are just staring at you it's like when i would go in for an audition and that goes back to like when you're auditioning for something uh you, you'll show up you'll get a casting call so it'll be like they need a five seven to five ten male you get in a room you're like yeah i just got the call my agent he's sending me in to do this audition you get there you sign your name in they hand you your script which is your monologue which you're going to be reading in front of the casting director and you walk in and just everybody looks like you <laughs> it's just like a bunch of people you're like yeah i'm so attractive i'm gonna get this and you're like oh wait they all look like me and then you're sitting there talking to people <laughs> and they're like yeah so i just got booked on this commercial it's like oh what have you done you're like I was in like this student film. <laughs> like this is like my first thing. They're like, ah, don't, dude, don't worry, man. Like most of us have been doing stuff. You'll be fine. And it's like, wait, what? <laughs> like, what did, did you just say everyone here's been doing stuff and I'm gonna be fine? Like, yeah, dude, you'll be fine. And it's like getting in your own head. And then like before they'll be like, oh, did you really wore like for girls? It's like worse. They're like, yo, you wore those shoes. Like you look like such a slut. And the girls are like, wait, what? And then they get in the interview and then they literally get into the room. So they give you your script. Most times you don't even get to prepare. So it's like three lines you have to like memorize. You walk in, it's the casting director. And usually someone there, if it's a two-part person, like they're reading the other lines and there's a video camera. You say your name into it and then you just do your lines. Literally a 30-second process. And they're like, either they'll say, hey, can you do it again? Or they'll say, all right, thanks. Have a great day. And that's it. That's all you get. It's like that interview for as an actor it's very scary because you're competing with everyone again. Like everyone there yeah. is going after the same role and you don't have time to prepare and it's literally all on you. But then you realize after you do it a bunch of times, you're like, okay, like I got nothing to lose. If you think about it, realistically, you're probably not going to get the part. There's really nothing like it's better to think that you're not going to get it. Then it's way more surprising when you do rather than be like, I'm going to get this part because that's not the way the acting world works. And it's the same way the interview world, like in like, business type jobs it's like you're competing against a wide like a range of different students it's like well my resume is super and we all think we're the shit our resume is awesome but it's like you walk in especially these big companies it's like oh yeah i'm from umass i'm the president of the economics club kid from like freaking like i like yale walks and he's like yeah i'm president of like the university (laughs) he's like i got a 4.0 um i can like 
have I can like ride horses, you know, yeah. and then like polo. My dad is like building our company, and I could give a crap about this job. Yeah. And they like hire him. You're like, dude, what the hell, man? It's like I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like a balance of keeping your expectations in check, and also, yeah, and also just having confidence. Well, you want to have confidence in your resume by being, hey, my resume is good. I have confidence in myself because I'm, like, proud of the things that I've done. And I think these things on my resume help me stand out. And there's a reason, like, it's not like they're just taking anyone in on the interviews. You're like, oh, well, you graduated from college. Most companies, they they like you enough to want to interview. So you need to look at that that way, too. Mm, yeah, actually, I mean, I think that's a, kind of a key point. Like, if you made it far enough that they would – bring you out to the actual place you're interviewing and take the time out of their days to talk to you, there's probably some interest in your application. Like there's definitely a chance that you'll actually get hired for the position. So I definitely like take it into account. Like, all right, like you've made it this far, you know, like say you're going for like a position at like a big company and the first round of applications is all online and there was 10,000 applications and then the first round after that is uh, phone interviews. So maybe they only have time to interview a hundred people over the phone. Like if you think about it, you're already you're already in the one percent if you've made it to the phone call just alone. So one hundred out of ten thousand, you know, like that's a pretty small amount of people that actually make it to that stage. So if you're prepared and you do well, and then they actually bring you out to interview you in person, like. You got you got to give yourself some sort of recognition for the fact that you're one of the final candidates and you actually have a chance. Well, to exactly. Get and um, obviously, this I don't know how this in the business world uh, would work, but so like for in like Hollywood, um, making it to final rounds of auditions like that spreads around. Like your agent and your manager, they use that stuff. Um, so, the, for example, I was talking to this uh, manager one time on set, and he was telling me about for Hunger Games, uh, they recently started bringing over a lot of talent from Australia. And as you notice, like Chris Hemsworth, um, the girl from Wolf of Wall Street, what's her name? Blonde girl who played Harley Quinn. Um, I don't know. I can't remember. But yeah, but uh, she's yeah. from Australia. The Hemsworth brothers are from Australia. A lot of great talent being found and brought over from Australia. Hugh Jackman. Um, but so this girl, she was 17 and she never had auditioned for anything before. And she ended up auditioning for Katniss. Margot Robbie. Margot Robbie. Yeah. But, uh, this girl, she ended up uh, auditioning for Katniss and she made it to the final 10 and she was the only one out of that final 10, uh, like the final auditions that had never had any experience. So they were able to like use that information to spread it around towns. Like, Hey, this girl's got some talent. She's like an unknown making it to the like last round of cuts for like hunger games to be like a billion dollar franchise. So it's like, yeah. look at it that way too. Making it just because you don't get the job doesn't mean that you weren't the best candidate or you weren't good. It just means they wanted to go with this other person. They maybe mm -hmm. they just fit. Obviously it's a lot different in acting in the business world. Yeah. But sometimes you're just like, you're just not a fit for that company, but yeah. they, you got to take pride in making it down. One of my friends, he just made it to the final round of interviews for this company. He was uh, like going to work for, and he said he had the worst um, interview of his life. And he ended up just like boofing it, like it was awful. <laughs> and he was just like, couldn't talk. He they asked him to do a role play, and he just sounded like an idiot. <laughs> and then he pretty much was like, yeah, they told me I didn't get the job. And I had like super faith in him that he was gonna get it. And I was like, oh man, you know, sometimes life works out that way. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times it's timing as well. Like sometimes you just need to be in the right spot at the right time to like really find the position that's right for you. well that's the thing too you never want to get too ahead of yourself because that does happen a lot like you get through the first interview you make it the second one you're like okay i got this it's like i've had times where i've like had auditions for things and it's like i made it to the second round and i was like the like director added me on facebook and i was like oh yeah he's totally gonna give me this role and then literally <laughs> i never heard back from anyone ever again they're just like all right cool but obviously in the business world um 
It's the same way. So sometimes it's like, oh, I made it. Just never think you have anything secure. Always want to have your back up against the wall, kind of, in a sense. Like, you always want to be striving. Don't think that just because of something that you have, unless you have, like, a connection or an in. And that's another great way to get jobs is just to have a connection. And that's why the more people you meet, more clubs you're in, better chance to grow. That's like being in a fraternity, being part of an organization. It's like, okay, this person works for this company. They can help hook it up. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's part of like the college experience, I'd say, is like really just like networking with people and meeting as many people as you possibly can. But yeah, so um, I want to switch up the topic a little bit. And we're talking about, uh, Jack, you, again, you were saying earlier how you're really into books now. And I want to talk about how, were you in growing up really an avid reader <laughs> or now, um, would you say, and how's that changed you now that you've started reading more? Um, obviously, you're getting on this grind where, you're about to graduate from college, so you don't want to be as partying as much. You want to be learning as much information as you can. Would you say this is – how has this affected your life? Okay, well, I think everyone should read more books because people – young people especially aren't reading books at the same rates, and they really should because I love reading books. But, yeah. Oh, but before I, that point, too, they say that if you do read – three books on any topic you know more than 99 percent of the population on that topic just because by having like three different perspectives or not even three different perspectives just like that amount of knowledge you take on that one topic allows you to be more uh of a in depth with it yeah no i'd say that's that's probably pretty accurate i mean i guess like the people that know more you about a certain subject or the people that like work and like that's their profession is that subject. But I mean like the rest of the people aren't going to like have taken the time to actually read books on it. But I mean, yeah, I guess like I was always like a big reader when I was a kid, like I would just rip through books and like stay up till four in the morning, like reading, just like turning pages and stuff. And then when I was in high school, I mean, I don't know if it like, I think there's gotta be some correlation to the emergence of smartphones and like people not reading because like, it takes way more of your time away from you, and also it like kind of decreases your attention span a little bit. I think um, so. What? It's like harder to sit through like actually reading a book. So when I was in high school, I like kind of stopped. I like fell off and didn't really read that many books. Like I did occasionally, and then like when I got to college, I was like, I mean, like this is part of learning, like reading, right? Like you can't just learn everything you need to know from classes. Like you need to do stuff on your own time. So I kind of like. I kind of really wanted to like revitalize my interest in reading and it was like kind of a slow process because I don't know it was like hard for me to read like I would read a chapter and realize at the end of the chapter that I had not actually read any of it. You didn't process any of it from me. Yeah, you just saw the I'd, words. I'd straight up just looked at the words and was thinking about something else the entire time so I'd have to go back and reread it but now I'm like I'm kind of like on the grind again I'd say I'm trying to read 52 books in 2019 that's one of my goals it's a book every week yeah that's the goal it's tough though well they were saying i was doing some research and it's like most very successful celebrities they said that they got rid of their smartphones they're now usually using a landline or they're using a flip phone and they only talk on the phone an hour a day one because you're not distracted by being able to you know to be on like social media or like just scroll on your phone when you're bored but also it makes their time so much more valuable so like when you have an hour a day it's not like you're just texting like sup bro it's like yeah. this is my hour a day that i'm on my phone if you need to talk to me talk to me here but that means you need to have your shit in order too so it's like i'm gonna give you 10 minutes tell me whatever you need to tell me right now don't like it makes you have to be more concise too rather than mm -hmm. just beating around the bush which a lot of us i think that's another problem that social media has created it's like we want to extend things rather than um we don't really we're not really good as i'm doing this we're not really good at getting to the point we have to like do a lot of like <laughs> thinking and being like uh yeah so um this and that and rather than being this is my point here you go take it rather yeah being concise being concise exactly yeah no i don't know i mean like that's like being concise when you're speaking and doing work is definitely important but a lot of people like the conciseness of like short articles and headlines and tweets and that type of thing well, it's like they I, should want to see the long form everyone just wants to read the headline i mean that's yeah. our whole that's the whole social media age is i'm just reading the headline even with this whole thing about this mag hat i don't i don't like that it's called a, like a mad hat like it's a mag, mag it's you know made america great again hat but oh, they use okay, like yeah. the the short whatever the hell they call it when you shorten something 
abbreviated yeah abbreviated whatever acronym acronym yeah so they acronym and it's like well this kid was he was these white kids were just standing in front of this native american and then they, they did research and they were like oh wait no they were just standing there there was a group like yelling in racial th- like racial slurs and then they like native american guy got in their face and he just stood there being respectful not like smiling and it's like now yeah if you just see the headline you're like well, of course, and people get so outraged now by just reading headlines. They won't ever read the thing. They'll, then their whole buy, like their information that they use is the headline in the picture. It's like, well, if you don't know the story, then how are you going to be angry about it? It's yeah. like, I can't believe this happened. Can you see this? And, well, like, and people see, like, people will see the original headline, and then that'll get in green in their head, and then they won't see the redaction that comes to these. Like, say, like, say, like, for example, <laughs> On, like, the political side of things, like, say there's some news outlet, for example, CNN, whatever, like, big news source, whatever, like, they tweet something about Donald Trump that's just wrong, like a misquote. Fake news. That makes him, (laughs) yeah, yeah, but, like, for example, like, they just tweet something that makes him look way worse, but it's, like, taken out of context, or maybe it was, like, an erroneous tweet. Like, I saw one of these on Twitter, like, a couple months ago, it was, like, I don't even know, it was like New York Times or something that like they quoted Donald Trump and they used the wrong word in, in the quote and it made him look way worse than like what it actually was. And the tweet got like 200,000 likes and like 50,000 retweets. So that many people are seeing that. Well, that many people are actively retweeting it and liking it. Millions of people probably saw the tweet. It's like the impressions then, of it are millions. And then they yeah. see that and they're like, oh, New York Times, like, that's a great news source. Donald Trump is the worst racist ever. And then two days later, people were like, this is not what he said. Like, if you look at the video, you're misquoting him. Like, it's completely taken out of context. So instead of deleting the tweet, they replied to themselves. And I don't want to bash the New York Times because I don't know if it was their tweet. It was another news source, I'm pretty sure. But, like, just using it as an example. Um, and they just replied to their own tweet. And they are like, oh, yeah, sorry. This is the actual thing. And that tweet got, like... 10,000 likes. We like, like controversy. No, like, no too. retweets at all. Like, that... The controversial tweet gets way more traction, and then the apology or the correction where it's the true information doesn't get the same amount of coverage. That's not like it's exciting, so, bro. So that, that initial headline is what sticks with people. And that happens, like, over the course of, like, multiple years. Like, people are seeing tons of stuff, like, in the same vein where it's taken out of context and, like, it's not the full story... But you can't, you don't have time to research everything you read. So, like, you just, like, start to believe certain things. And then it builds this, like, image of someone. And especially in the public eye in politics, I think this happens a lot. Where it's not actually completely accurate to the point. Because, like, you didn't take the time to research each thing you're reading about them. Well, that's the idea of a journalist is that you're supposed to, as a journalist... I'm supposed to believe your credibility so that when I, using you as a source that I believe you because you're like a credible source. So I yeah. trust what you're putting out there is actual fact. It's not mis- taken out of context. So I believe it. But now it's a problem where it's, it's the same happened in companies too. People you sometimes will use an inferior product if it comes out before. So it's like first to market is what people use. So like Uber was first to market. Maybe Lyft was a better app, but everyone's going to use Uber because it's out and Uber is now a term. Like you would, I'd Uber with Lyft yeah. per se, right? So if people are just going to put out a news story, it's like people are going to see the news story first, and then that's going to be their whole like picture of what the whole like event is, and they're going to be that's it. They don't need to do any more research. They've already seen it. So yeah, and they don't need. And people don't like to be told they're wrong too. So once like everyone is very strong to their opinion so once you have your opinion you're gonna be like no you're wrong i'm not wrong i'm never wrong i'm never wrong ever how could i be wrong i saw it on cnn i saw it on twitter (laughs) yeah i mean i think it's like i think it's shameful of the news outlets for them not to take a more serious effort at actually vetting the information they're using and editing their articles in a way that shows the most truthful picture because but it, they people don't... see through it and it makes them look terrible and they lose their credibility. Like she's so like the Washington post, like super credible news source that's been like respected for years, but you can tell they have a bias. Like it's okay for a news source to have a bias. Like some of them 
there's right leaning, there's left leaning, there's centrist, there's some that don't. Care Most about people politics. have a bias. Like, oh, there's always going to be some sort of bias, but it's one thing if you're like inherently taking things out of context because people aren't stupid and they're going to read through that and see. That's why a lot of these like people that are just out here being rational and telling the truth and like trying to get to the bottom of things are gaining so much traction on social media websites because people are just dying for someone to just tell them like the truth they just want to hear like the way things are happening and make their own decisions about things they don't want to be treated like stupid well some people i'd say like the problem that we always have too is when you are someone that is rational and you can see through the crap you gotta look at not everyone can see through the crap and some people use the news like things that were credible in the past as their only source so they're not gonna they're going to say the Washington Post is wrong. It's like, no, I've read the Washington Post for 20 years. They're not wrong. It's like, they're not biased. They say it like it is. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you grew up building that opinion yeah. of something, and then, therefore, it's like, you grew up when you're little. It's like, your dad and mom, they know the answer to everything. So it's yeah. like, oh, my mom was like, where do babies come from? My mom said they came from a pigeon. <laughs> my mom told me that babies came from girls' belly buttons growing up. So it's so like, when you were pregnant, there was no belly button. And I was like, okay, that's where babies come from. Yeah. And then someone's going to tell me, it's like, no, actually, well, they're, when the mommy and daddy really love each other. And it's like, no, that's not right. It's like, my source is way more credible than your source. Yeah. But I mean, I think most people are intelligent enough to sit through the BS, but a lot of people are just probably too lazy to or not, they don't care. Enough to. And that's the thing too. Our whole generation, we don't even like care about politics. I'd say, like, we're the first generation we don't care about religion. Really, we don't care about politics as much. It's like that's what you got to look at it too from the idea. Like, you know, we're college kids with tons of debt, so we're like Bernie Sanders, dude. He's saying we're going to just get rid of all the debt. Yeah. I don't like. We don't understand how that thing, like half that crap, works. But he said it, so it must be true, and he can get it done. Well, I feel like. I mean, like, I'm like semi interested in politics. Like, I read about politics a good amount, and I was like pretty. I'd say I was, like, pretty closely following, like, the election cycle. Um, but, I mean, it's just, like, these politicians are so disconnected from this generation. Like, dude, you're going to say, like, the video of Elizabeth Warren on Instagram was just so cringeworthy. Like, she, like, sets this camera up, and this is, like, her, like, one of her, like, advertising, um, like, bits for her presidential campaign in 2020, and it's, like, she sets up the lab, she's, like, hey, guys, like, how's it going? Like, I'm gonna go get a beer. Like, I'm gonna drink a beer. So she, like, goes to the fridge and gets a beer out of the fridge and, like, pops it open, and then her husband comes over. She's, like, oh, like, what's up, honey? Like, this is my hubby. Like, love him to death. Like, you want a beer? Like, I'm drinking a beer. And the... And the Hashtag and the man husband, crush Monday. That's my husband, The husband's, like, nah, I'm all set on the beer. Like, enjoy your beer. Like, it's so scripted and, like, weird. It's, like, what? Like... This is, like, who is advising Elizabeth Warren to, like, try and connect with the youth of America by doing this? Like, you look so fake. Like, people see through that bullshit so easily. Like, dude, it's so ridiculous that that was posted. Like, dude, Elizabeth Warren, if she wants to run for president... She should be she playing should... Fortnite and listening to Drake is what she <laughs> should be doing. Then she'll be real relatable. Yeah, sure. No, but, like, she should have someone who is, like, in college to, like tell her and watch that video and be like you look fucking weird like don't don't fake it because all these politicians are so fake and like you can see through it and none of them have like actual connection with like the youth i think the real big problem that you just like said was the idea that just like she should have someone in college telling her what to do right but the idea is when you're young it's like you're not as intelligent as me because you're not as old that's that's kind of like how the old generation views us too right so it's like oh you're a millennial you're an idiot. It's like, you just want to sit there and do your Insta face and your Fortnite and your stupid floss <laughs> dance and be like, catch me outside, girl. It's like, no, we're not all like that, I promise. Yeah. But it's, you're not as respected as everyone else yeah. because you're younger. It's like, dude, you yeah. didn't experience it. And that's true. I Like, you have more experience than me, but I think a big problem that the older generations have now is they don't listen to us as, like, yeah. as they should. They just have someone... Whoa. They don't, I like a lot of people like, cause times are changing so fast. That I don't think a lot of people realize, I mean, it's unrealistic to be like, I'm going to be a pro Fortnite gamer, but is it really that unrealistic anymore to be like, okay, I want to like do something with social media, be like a media person for a company. Like those are attainable jobs that you can get without even needed. going to college. You, like, you don't need to go to college to do those types of things. And I'll, like kids are good at that. So there's these new, like this new wave of like, 
of different kinds of jobs and there's all this entrepreneurial stuff happening with our generation that the older generation is just really disconnected from. They don't understand it, but people are out there making a lot of money and like making a living doing these types of things. So it's not like completely unreasonable that you don't go to school and get like a traditional job path because like if you think about it, how many years are you going to be staying at the same company? Like for people our age, it's like, you're going to be at a company for a year, maybe two. Like if you found your own company, whatever, you can work there forever, but you're not going to like, it's not like the old days where you go to the factory and get a job at Ford and they pay for your pension and you have a 30 year career there. And then you retire with your house, which holds most of your savings. And then your kids go to school. Like, it's not like yeah, that. Anymore. Our generation's about like, yo man, I'm just going to quit everything that I don't get instant gratification for. <laughs> and then you're like, all right, sick dude. Now what yeah. am I going to do? It's like, Oh, wait. I mean, there's a lot of people like that, but I think there's also a, the other side of it where a lot of people are super, super smart and coming up with innovative ways to make money and have careers and really f found themselves in this kind of like new economy that's mom i have like evolving. 10k instagram followers i don't need to go to college <laughs> stupid bitch <laughs> yeah but the thing is like if you're smart enough you, you can you can monetize 10,000 instagram followers and you can turn that into something that's like everything you need 10,000 like you need a million followers to make money off this yeah. stuff it's like no man like if you, it's about hitting an audience now. And like, yeah. if you have some, someone like Gary Vee, he'll tell you about well, dude, it. Yeah. Say like, all right, I'll give you an example. Like you could have 10,000 followers and you could be like, your career could be like a fitness person. Like you post pictures of you, like working out in the gym, whatever, like videos, like here, this is what I'm eating today. Like all that stuff. Like, yeah, that might not seem like a big deal, but if you have a following of 10,000 and you're like, all right, I'm going to. Well, you're gonna be a personal trainer. You sell advice to them. Like, yeah, you sell like you sell like your workout plan, and say you get like, say you get five ten people yeah. to out of your ten thousand followers For to buy your bucks. to buy your workout plan. Like that's like that's a significant like start for you as like a person who does do fitness stuff because like the people that aren't on Instagram, like the old heads that are giving fitness lessons and working at the gym like they don't have that kind of like outreach and they're not doing the same thing you're doing to like interact with people you're working with so like it's a good way to like connect with people and and kind of bridge the gap between like the traditional style of working a job like being a fitness instructor and kind of this like new age way of going about it where it's like you use social media i think the nine to five culture is dying and it's becoming Everyone wants to just do their own thing. Yeah. But the problem is most of us only know the basic understanding of, like, we look at Instagram as an everyday person, a personal Instagram account is something that, you know, like a celebrity with like Post Malone, right? Post Malone's got like 6.9 million followers. Yeah. And it's like, he's not on Instagram scrolling all day, right? He's yeah. got a PR social media guy that's taking those pictures, that's running through stuff. It's not like... Remind. music it's your brand like most of this stuff is run through so many different people before stuff's posted yeah i like to use the example of selena gomez it's like yeah she posts pictures got has the most instagram followers but she literally has a social media person she's like i don't even look at instagram it's not good for my mental health but yet yeah. we're looking at people it's like yeah i'm gonna be a instagram person because i'm on instagram all the time it's like no yeah like you know how much work goes into like a 30 second vine like back in the day a six second vine would take like five hours of like there'd be like a budget and you need to film people. And it's like all this stuff for six seconds that people are going to, it's going to go over like 2 million impressions. It's like, yeah, because that's to make that much money, you're not going to put something crappy out there. And yeah. unless that's your brand, these get degrees, but mostly C's and A's are for assholes. But exactly. <laughs> it's like, you need to figure out what your brand is and then you need to kind of put all your time into that. Or you can like, so you can be a hundred percent in on something, but that means you're going to cut out a lot of things in your life. Like to be the best at something, you need to be 100% all in. But if, or you can be 80% in five things, right? So you're not going to be the CEO. You're not going to be the master of whatever. But that doesn't mean you can't still have a good life. Yeah. I think our whole idea about life now is just, you know, being the number one person. Being, it's like we want to outshine our friends almost. It's like, I like my friends, but I want them to think I have a cooler life than them almost, in a sense. Some people. Like, it's about being validated by the people I don't know. Mm. And that's the point that I think our whole generation, like we'd rather be cool from something stupid, like us being on fifth year doing like 
drunk freaking nosedive on like the table in front of a thousand people, <laughs> like being like, yeah, dude, I'm the man. I was that me on uh, that video. And in reality though, if you think about it from like a, if you never knew what Instagram, you're like, that kid looks like an idiot. Why the hell is he doing that? Like, that's not cool. Yeah. But I don't know what the future holds. It just doesn't, I don't know what's going to happen. It's just like our generation doesn't really look good. College gets more expensive. We have all this debt. Something bad's going to happen eventually with this. Like, what are we gonna, how are we going to get houses and cars and stuff? We have $1.2 trillion of college debt. It's like, yeah, all those liberal arts majors, like, that are working at, like, their, I don't even know, their, like, gluten-free like coffee shops it's like yeah they're gonna pay off this debt like with their 11 dollar an hour job after yeah. getting their freaking well dude we did a project on this on one of my like courses last semester and we calculated using like um the bureau of labor statistics we use their data for discretionary income and we like kind of like looked at it backwards from age like 35 down to like age 22 which is like average college graduating age and we use like the average numbers for how much college debt each person has the average salary and, like in order to put a 20 percent down payment on a two hundred thirty five thousand dollar house which is um i think it's the nahb average home price like it takes you seven years after graduating college assuming you get a job paying like seventy thousand dollars a year i think with three percent or so which annual is, increase yeah which is like which is pretty high but like assuming you get that job like and you're barely that's like five percent of all like, college graduates get that job and you're like pretty being pretty conservative with how you spend your money like it's gonna take you seven years to be able to afford that down payment on a home and you also have to factor in the fact that there's rising interest rates right now and mortgage prices are going to be going up and traditionally house prices have also been going up. And our dollar's dying slowly by the day. And it's, it's like, there's, it's like, it's going to be interesting to see how the living situation plays out for a lot of kids. Our age well, did you hear about, it's tough to buy a house. Did you hear about all the college debt that th those college kids don't have to pay because the loan companies lost their paperwork? People are losing $80,000 of the, well, they're, getting $80,000 of their loan wiped away because all these companies, they lost the paperwork, so they can't prove that they signed it. No. So, but, I mean, what's going to end up happening... Like they lose mine. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> what's going to end up happening is everyone's going to end up, like, the bubble... It's going to crash. The bubble's going to destroy the market, and they're just going to default on all this debt. We're just going to have one point two trillion, and everyone's going to be like, all right, cool. It's like, we all have terrible credit. Yeah. Just deal with it, man. Deal with it. I don't know it. what the solution for that is. I mean, I don't know. People are thinking it's going to be like the next financial crisis, but I don't really take that. I don't, I don't view it like that at all. I just think... It's going to be a lot of people are going to have hard living situations if they don't figure out. Like, but we're like the worst generation to deal with that, too. It's like we can deal with anything hard and we like freak out. It's like, yeah. how are we going to deal with like, wait, what? I'm going to have to live home for the next like 20 years now. Yeah. And yeah. then. Yeah. People also just aren't good with money at all. Well, that's not, again, they don't teach you that in school. Yeah, they should. I mean, I wish I took like home ec courses in high school, but they didn't have those. It's like, why don't they teach us that? Why don't they teach us how to cook? They don't teach us how to do anything productive, but and you're like, well, why? Because uh, I want to know how to cook from <laughs> class. Like, that's yeah, sick. it's like teach me how to pay my bills, how to save my money, and like yeah. teach me how to cook and what what teach me how to go to the grocery store and what I should buy. <laughs> teach me how to dougie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they they do they do teach you that. Yeah, that's how uh, I learned. It's like teach me how to grind <laughs> and teach me how to dougie. Dude, I learned how to dougie so well in high school, bro. Dude, dougie all day. <laughs> it's like, dude, I want to floss. I want a Fortnite dance, dude. <laughs> There's something, I saw like a meme, it was like, when uh, when anyone below like 16 has to stand still for like more than one second, it's just like floss, right? <laughs> yeah. right? And it's so true, dude. You're in the grocery store and these kids are just doing the dance. You're like, what is going on? Yeah, it's crazy. Like, Everyone's doing the floss, bro. It's such a bad dance. Stop doing it. The young kids. My uh, dad, it's like, again, it's like how we're kind of like destroying like cable and stuff because we're all watching like YouTube and like, you yeah, know, streaming. Netflix, streaming. Streaming is just so much superior. It's not even. Well, because you don't have to deal with the commercials that like, obviously yeah. now they're ads and dude, stuff. Dude, I can't watch commercials anymore, man. I can. Have you ever like sat down? Like, dude, I watched some football games with my dad last weekend and like, I was like, dude, what the fuck's up with all these commercials? There's so many commercials. I need to, I can't watch this. Like, where's my one 30 second ad at the beginning of the video that oh, I can just wait for dog? Oh, yeah. Like, people have dogs here. Hey, what up? What? Oh, that's a big What's good? What up, dude? Yeah, this huge dog just pulled up outside. He wants to come hang out. Something's sick. 
But um, yeah, what we're talking commercials. about commercials. Uh, yeah, just how like my dad was like. So my my sister, one of my sisters, she's in fourth grade, and he walked in on her watching YouTube, and it's like she started out watching like the number one YouTuber is literally that kid who opens toys and reviews them. Like Ryan reviews toys, and he made like twenty seven million dollars just opening toys. What? Yeah, right. <laughs> I've so never they, even heard of this kid. Right. So people are making money opening toys and reviewing them. People watch, will spend 10 minutes of their life watching a kid open up a toy, review it, and it'd be like, 8 out of 10. <laughs> Dude, I mean, do you ever watch, like, people's vlogs on YouTube? Dude, like, I do. There's, like, some people that, like, I'll occasionally, like, watch their vlogs. And I was, me and my friend, now we're talking about this, we're just like, how weird of a concept is it that we're actually just watching people just do stuff they normally do? It's like, it's like, hey, I'm, like, headed to the grocery store right now, like, gonna go pick up some groceries, and I'm just sitting here, like, eating popcorn, like, dude, I wonder what he's gonna get at the grocery store. <laughs> well, like, you have, like, think about it, though, it's like, you watch pretend characters, like, might as well watch a real person do something yeah. real, right? But, I mean, I, I guess it's, like, relatable. Yeah, it's just like, dude, I I go to the grocery store, too, man. I feel dude, the same. Dude, I just went to the grocery store, bro. This is so relatable. <laughs> but then it's like, yeah, so my so my sister was watching, like, you know, people open up toys. And, like, the older generations, too, they don't get that. I and mean, I don't yeah. get that. But my dad was like, that's idiotic. You can't watch that. And then he, like, walked in <laughs> after, and he's like, my sister went from video of a kid opening toys to, like, a woman talking about childbirth. And she's like, you're banned from YouTube. It's like, a fourth, of, like, a fourth grader can get on the internet and, like, watch someone on YouTube be like, this is how childbirth works. Dude, YouTube is dangerous. It's crazy. And the then algorithms you, are crazy, man. They'll yeah. suck you. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I man, let me, like, you gotta realize, like, the people raising the young kids now are, like, Logan and Jake Paul. It's crazy that, like, uh, yeah. it's like, they're not listening to quality content like this. <laughs> they're listening to, like... Yeah, they don't have, people don't ask their parents for advice. They just go on the internet. Dude, Logan Paul told me if I go in the woods and see dead people, I can laugh at them. It's fine. <laughs> Logan Paul is kind of an idiot, though. <laughs> no, but, I, you, you know, you're not an idiot when you just, like, sell merch to little kids. And, like, because, dude, they you capitalize on a market. And, yeah, like, those no, are the but, like, most I'm impressive... I mean, I'm, he's definitely yeah. like a smart, like business wise, because he knows his audience and he's probably raking in cash. But like, I'm saying, like him actually posting that video is so stupid. But then, like, the more I think about it, it's like, all right, YouTube let that be up for like it got like six million views and like some ridic- <laughs> and like YouTube let it be up until so it's weird. It's like, and then now YouTube's like you know promoting them. It's like it's like almost plan to do stuff with like it's like then they can change the copyright stuff that's like conspiracy talk we don't even get in that yeah but yeah uh pretty much dude have you ever seen mukbang what is mukbang (laughs) this is a real thing look it up on youtube it's like it's basically i think it originated in korea and it's straight up people just streaming themselves eating like fat plates of food oh yeah i've seen that huge plates of food and people just watch them eat it's like, and they get, like, millions of views. But that was, like, man versus food, and that was also, like, uh, whatever the other... I know, but What's it's... the other food thing that they used to do? What's that YouTube show? Uh, Epic uh, Mealtime. Epic Mealtime, yeah. it's, yeah. like, the same thing. Yeah, but that's, like... But it's like a little co- more nuanced because they're like making like cool creations and like so this is making just, like giant castles out of hamburgers. You're like, all right, that's pretty cool. But this is just like them in like a buffet. And it's like, like here's them, a whole plate of food. Like and you're just watching them eat it the whole time. Like it's not like they're like making the food and there's like commentary and they have yeah. Like this is just straight up people shoving food down their face. It's like, what's your for job? Five minutes. Well, I, like, go to restaurants and I eat food for 45 minutes. On <laughs> dude, YouTube. we have this dude, Nico Avocado. There's a video of him just, like, chowing, like, noodles and shit, and he starts crying because he's like, I've gotten <laughs> so fat, and I don't know why. <laughs> it's like, dude, there's a hundred videos on your channel of you eating, like, 10,000 plus calories. The dude's slamming hamburgers like it's no one's business well they gotta realize like that's content well people rather watch that than read a book now I mean, like, if he's getting millions of views he's just making some money so it's like but you, you I, gotta, we can't act like views or i can't like people views like views are currency dude. yeah it's wild but like then that's if you're spending your time like wasting your time doing that it's like Damn, it's like holy, like how much like time have I wasted in my life just like thinking about fake trades I've done in like NBA 2K? It's like I'd spend hours being like, yo, what if I traded like Paul Pierce and KG for LeBron James? That'd be <laughs> sick. It's like hours of my life are just gone to that yeah. thing. It's like if it's giving you entertainment, it's like if it's giving you entertainment at the time, is it worth it? It's like no, man. It's like uh, yeah. It's a damn- I, mean, I guess it depends on how much other stuff you're doing. Like if you're doing all your homework, you're in a bunch of clubs, you got a job, like. <laughs> 
if you want to sit down and think about... If you want to like, sit down and watch a guy... NBA trades, like, that's probably fine in my book. I've got, got a bunch of clubs, you know, i got, like, 30 minutes today of myself. Maybe you should, Might as well watch this guy eat, like, a freaking whole plate of mukbang. <laughs> this is why we should be reading more books, because you can read books instead of watching <laughs> watching mukbang videos of a dude shoving... At least have our podcast on the background while you're watching mukbang videos. Yeah. Least. <laughs> Mute the mukbang video and just play this podcast in the back. But that's the thing, too. I, like, with the like, great thing about podcasts is, like, well, if I want to sit and play xbox or something i can still have a podcast on so like i can be playing xbox but i can also be listening to something it's like i try now at this point not like being a senior and i think you're at the same level too it's like you're trying to i always want to be learning something or improving in some way at mm. regardless like i don't want to you don't want to waste a lot of time anymore mm, as you get yeah. older you're like okay now i want to structure my time better and it's tough right so you're saying this semester you have class on tuesday and thursday but monday wednesday friday you don't have class so you're free to do whatever the hell you want it's like having that much free time is that would you say is a plus or would you say it's actually very difficult well i mean obviously i think it's a plus because i like having a lot of time to myself i prefer not to be in classes um but i mean i think having a wealth of time like you kind of Sometimes I like having more structure because, all right, say, like, I was doing classes every day. Like, that would force me to be on campus, like, and in between my classes, I'd be like, okay, I have an hour. Like, I can either grab something to eat real quick or, like, send a bunch of emails that I need to get out and, like, do some homework. And I feel like having that structure really helps me, like, stick into a schedule or whatnot. This semester, I'm going to have, like, more free time. So I don't know if I'm going to be, like, on as rigid of a schedule and I'm going to have a lot more time to do things I want to do, but I don't know if I'll necessarily, like, be the best for me. So I think I want to, like, kind of, like, fit more structure in there just because it makes it easier to get things done. And I think time, for me, at least. That is the thing, too, about being in, like, the middle of nowhere, Massachusetts. It's tough being here and that, like, if you were in the, like, that was a good thing about living in Boston. It's like, you could get a job in the city. Like, you could have an internship right now and, like, for a company just, like, when you're here, you're so far from really anything. Yeah, it's like true. tough, but obviously most people don't look at college in that kind of point. And yeah. they're like, yo, it's like, well, dude, when yeah, I'm a yeah. senior and I have no classes, like what am I going to be able to do for jobs? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's totally true. I guess like, yeah, I mean, it would be cool to have like an internship right now just because I have time to do it. But that's what, like, most seniors like to do is they do, um, well, like, that's what I really like about schools like Northeastern is they do the program where it's like you go to school for two years and then you spend two years working a, a co-op. So, like, if your major is, like, mm -hmm. um, communications, yeah. it's like you can get a job working for, like, the Nesson Sports, the, like, working for the, like, home of the Red Sox, doing, yeah. like, stuff like yeah. that. And it's also... That's what a lot of like the big Ivy League schools. What I do like they have is like you can create your own major at Stanford. You're like, what do you want to learn? You're like, you can do that here actually. You can create your own major here. Yeah, it's called BDIC. That sounds it's like in, like how's that work though? You all right? Well, I think you have like a there's a ton of work that goes into it, but they talked about it a lot at like orientation because they always talk about this girl who made her major cheese. Like, she literally majored in cheese, and now she makes cheese and sells it and makes, like, tons of money when she graduated from here. But she was just, like, her family was always, like, they were cheese makers, yeah. and she wanted to just make cheese for a career. So she majored in cheese <laughs> through this, like, program. And you have to select, like, you have to select a certain amount of UMass classes that will fit in and kind of write why they'll benefit like your major and how they lead towards your like ultimate goal of whatever you want to major in. And then you also have like projects that you're doing on the side. And probably get like mentors and, and you stuff. You have to have like sponsors, I think. Yeah. I don't know the details. Of I it, think but it sounds kind of cool. Th that sounds like what college should be. It should be, instead of us having, like, this generic thing, it should be like, okay, well, this is, an, I mean, obviously, some people have no idea what they want to do, and it's like, well, I like Fortnite. Do you kind of major in Fortnite? Yeah. It's like, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you can. I mean, you have to, like, I feel like to do something like that, you'd have to really know what you want to do beforehand. But I think... Like, that I, I, like, I thought about it, like, kind of a little bit, but I was like, there's nothing that I am... <laughs> have a super strong yeah, passion for. That I would be able to, like to do this yep. and have the ability to actually like schedule it all out. And but you like, like, you know, you like, you like learning, you like philosophy and stuff. So you could just, it's just like kind of taking your interests and being able to like give them a title. 
and oh, like, yeah. can join them. Yeah. So I mean, if I, I if I knew the things I knew now about like myself and my interests, I definitely think there's some things I could have done that I'd probably I probably would have changed my major. To be honest, like I, I if I did that program starting right now, I think there's tons of different interest to me that i could totally like major in like one dreaming dude have you ever had a lucid dream yeah it's like dude, it's the coolest thing ever the idea that like you can that's what college should be it i want to like research like i've done i've read a couple books and like done as much like research on the internet as i can but like i want to like go in labs yeah i want to like s- like see how people's brains are we- working when they're actually dream because wa- it's the coolest shit ever i want to do like yeah like a bunch of different research like i want to like go and do experiments like get yeah. like freaking like that stuff that like i should be able to do i mean you can there's very like there are a lot of opportunities like in here at umass you can like go to the library and you can find a professor and something you're interested because they're doing like research stuff and they'll like hook you up with that professor and then you get to help them do research which is like very cool but i think college should be more that where it's kind of just like helping you grow and helping you expand rather than just being like, well, this is your major. Take a, you're required to take a math and English a history, a foreign language. And it's like, here are a bunch of business classes, like yeah. sick, man. I mean, I guess you can't really like, it's hard to say that that's like the college's responsibility. Cause it's kind of on the individual to want to learn and expand like their own minds. So, I mean, I guess, I guess you could say that, like, yeah, they should be influencing people in the right direction and be like, yeah, like, you should learn, like, there's so many different things you can learn about yourself, about the world, like, that should be, like, kind of the motivation. That's what college used to be. I think think it's kind of still like that, but... It's it's so much more for money now. Yeah, I mean, it's driven by money. It's like a business. Well, the but... idea that you could be one credit, like, you could be one class from graduating, and they're like, well, you got to come pay for that class. Like, they, it's like, if you're one class away and you can't take it in the fall, it's like, well, you got to take it in the spring, man. It's like, yeah. I have to stay at school and pay to be at school for one class for my degree. You can't, I can't take another class. You're like, no. Nope. Yeah, no. Yeah, I mean, they should have more flexibility around stuff like that, but I don't know. I guess it does depend on, like, the kind of person, though, because, I don't know, I think part of the cool thing about college is that you're just alone like in a sense that you're kind of like away from home whatever learning new things and you kind of just get to experiment with different stuff that you're interested in and like really just kind of like learning by experience like you're going out like maybe getting your first like real legitimate job or like you're joining these clubs and trying new things like maybe you like find a sport that you like doing or like you find these like different subjects of like research that you're interested in like dude i didn't know i'd have any interesting in like reading about dreaming but like i had a lucid dream one night in college and i was like this is so cool and i just used my free time to read about it and it's like i don't know like that's the type of thing that happens like at school i, guess. I don't think college does a good job though so say you come in with a major and it's like, well, I'm doing this major one because I'm kind of interested in it from high school or it's like going to get me a good job. And then you start doing it and you're not, you know, it's not for you. You want to change. How do you know what major you want to do unless you've done research? Like there's not a good like unless you come in undecided, you get to the experiment. Yeah. And there's like no way for me to be like, OK, like I was a business major. And I did some acting and stuff. So I was like, well, maybe I want to do theater. And like, I try to go to conservatories. But then I was like, my family was like, you got to go to college. You got to get a degree. You can't go to school for acting. So I was like, okay. Then if I, if there was no acting, like I had to go do that stuff on my own, which is fine. But what if I'm a kid like you and I have no idea, but I'm just stuck in business? Like, how do I, what if you really like philosophy? But it's like, if you don't have to, there's no way for you to learn that unless you take that class. And it's not like you're forced to take a philosophy class. You know what I'm saying? There's yeah. college should do a more, there should be like a personality test or something that would be like, oh, this is what you like. These are the majors that are good for this rather than being, I mean, they kind yeah. of try and do that stuff, but people look at their career yeah. so much more as a job. It's yeah. like, it's like, oh, I'm an accountant. I'm going to make a hundred thousand dollars. Cause this is like, you know, this is the median pay. So I'm guaranteed to get this. Like you're not guaranteed shit, man. Yeah, I mean, I guess the only thing, like, 
it'd be difficult for colleges to do that, but they could definitely change the structure of how you take class. I mean, that's kind of what they try and do with the gen ed thing, though, I know, in a sense. But they don't like they, they, really. Yeah. Like, they have all the different gen ed, like, categories. So, like, you take a science, like, you take a humanities course, you take a writing course. So, like, that's kind of what they try to do a little bit, but I don't think it's really well done. You know what they should do? And then I think about it, they should do it kind of like in, uh, there's that stupid movie Divergent, and it's like, you have to, like, pick your, like, you're, you know, like, you're a win person, you're whatever. So, like, your first day of orientation, you can't pick your major. Well, obviously, some people are applying to schools. But you should be, like, you get into the school, and then, like, your transfer orientation at the school, they kind of, like, your first day freshman, it's, like, all the majors come and talk about what they are, and you have people in the fields. And, like, these are the kind of jobs. And at the end, you're like, yeah. what is your major? What do you want to be? Yeah. So people can, like, because people don't really know, like, if you don't, there's, we offer so many majors, but, like, no one tells me what they are and what they offer with job yeah, careers. Yeah. Well, you have to, like, you have to go seek that kind of stuff out yourself, which is, like, if you don't know, like, that, you know, that's happening and you don't know how college works, like, maybe you kind of miss out on some of that. Because, like, dude, if you don't, like, you need to have guidance of people. That's why it's good to, like, talk to all like, people go to the school upperclassmen and whatnot because they will tell you, all right, like, you should go to the, like, go to the career fair and, like, go to the, go to the club fair and, like, talk to all these different clubs because, I mean, I didn't do that when I was a freshman. Like, I didn't know to do that. Exactly. Like, no one's no, there telling you. Yeah. I mean, like, your RA try to tell you, I guess, but it's not, like, I didn't have, like, someone that was older than me being, like, yo, dude, go to the club fair. Like, there's some cool clubs. Like, you'd probably, like, join someone. Like, you have to, like, kind of actively seek that stuff out. And I guess, like, at that time in my life, I was not really... Well, you come into I was college... That not, like, I wasn't like, oh, I need to join a club right now. You like, didn't? I was kind of just like... Whatever. You thought they were stupid. It's like... like I thought I'd figure college, out what I was interested in doing. We have this idea, too. Like, we think of a lot of things in college as they were in high school. It's like, yo, like, in high school, I knew people in clubs, and, like, I didn't think that was cool in a sense. Like, I played sports and like high school like i didn't want to play intramurals that's it that's all i care about you don't like see yeah. the idea of being in a club you're like why would i want to waste my time being part of something that it's like what is that mm, yeah so i think you need to really do a better job colleges need to do a better job of like letting their students know all these it's like you pay for all these programs and your tuition and it's like they always tell you it's like come get this because you already pay for it it's like wait i'm paying for something i don't use it's like well I mean, you can use them. We offer them, but we're not going to tell you. Like, we're going to tell you in the beginning when we just throw all this information at you and this is it. Yeah. I mean, it's very, I don't Definitely know. Definitely just, like, I don't know, more people need to take advantage of the resources and clubs on campuses. I mean, colleges do offer, I mean, they get all this money and they, they put in all this incredible equipment. You can rent all this stuff you can do. It's just, like, no one's kind of, like, letting you know about it. You got to do, but that's like, you're going to lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. It's like, I can tell you about the stuff mm, and yeah. you can be like, that's interesting, but unless you, it's like the things you really like are things that you've decided to research yourself. You're into it. Like that's why it's your passion. Like yeah. you want to know more about it. And like when you go out of your way to learn more about it, that even makes it more exciting. But sometimes it's nice when someone's like, hey, man, like check this out. And then that leads me down to the path. Yeah, that's why these college freshmen should be listening to D's get degrees. It's like, yeah, dude, trust They'll me. I'll tell I'm, you all the inside information. You want the secrets, bro? You want to realize that you can just transfer to any school? Get to Harvard? Go to like, go to school? Dude, you can go to Harvard. <laughs> all you need to do is transfer. <laughs> just get like a 2-0. They'll let you in. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> Don't give a crap, dude. They just want your money. Everyone just wants your money. <laughs> wants your money, bro. They just want your money, dude. Dude, then they want you to join the rat race. Join the rat race, dude. Dude, but like, what about my degrees? What about my 401k, man? I want my 401k. So, dude, yeah. you got to join it. It was an IROTH. Got to get an IROTH. What the hell's an IROTH, bro? Roth, Roth IRA. Roth IRA. <laughs> it's like, yeah, the ec economics club guy. It's like he'll let you know the it's secrets, the investment bro. Investment club, bro. Get it right. It's like, dude, we're gonna we're gonna get crazy on the stock market, and then we're gonna do some coke. We don't do coke in college. <laughs> That's what they don't want you to know, man. Everyone's on coke all the time. <laughs> no, dude, everyone on everyone in college is on Adderall all the time. That's the secret too about college. It's like kids in high school don't tell you Adderall of like because people I knew growing up that did Adderall. It's like they never wanted to do it one because the, when they did Adderall, they actually would sit calm in class. They're like, no, man, I can't think. And then like you get to college, and everyone's like. Yo, bro, Adderall, it's like this mirror, it's like the limitless drug. And you're like, what do you mean? And you take it and you're like, whoa. And then you're like, we all have ADHD now because of our phones. Like society <laughs> has created ADHD. Like we all get, yeah. we're all on Adderall now because we can't literally hold our attention. From Dude, I'm, I, that's why I can't, 
I mean, I'm getting better at it now because I'm, like, really making an effort to, like, read. I'm doing a lot of audiobooks, too, because audiobooks are a good resource, but... Well, audiobooks are like, dude, great. you can't... Like, I can't read, like, a page without, like, thinking about something else and, like, wanting to check my phone. So that's another, that's another thing I try to do, like, leave my phone away, like, in my desk drawer or in my backpack while I'm doing work because it's way less likely to distract. The problem is though too is like I like listening to podcasts I like listening to music so I like to have my phone on me but then it's like I'll be listening to a song or something and it's like okay now I want to like change the next song and then you just get caught up yeah. in, in I the, usually just go for those like if I'm gonna do that while I'm doing work I'll play it, put a podcast on it's like three hours and just leave it going or I'll play like a playlist for studying music that's just like three hours long so i don't have to know what we really don't do anymore that i've done and it's like an incredible thing just like list like everyone to on college like we're all walking around with headphones in and shit like walking around with nothing in and just listening to what's going on like yeah. how often do you just go out in like public or just even you're in the car just like have complete silence it's like most of us can't even do like a paper without having to listen to some kind of background noise like if you're just like walking like it's it's almost clears your head because when you don't have anything like forcing noise in your ears, it's like, Hey man, like you can like think more clearly than rather being like, I got this music freaking bumping in my head like all the time. It's like, you can't sit still. It's like, just like sit down and like read a book in quiet for like five minutes. Again, like it really does clear your head. Dude. Also. All right. I keep going back to this lucid dreaming thing, but one of the like methods of inducing lucid dreams is like, Basically, when you're inside of a dream, you do something that you do in real, like, waking life in the dream, and it'll be different or, like, distorted in the dream. So, for example, it's called a reality check, where during the day, while you're awake and conscious, you count, like, look at your hands and count your fingers, like, and you see five fingers. And then in the dream, if you count your hand, like, sometimes there will be six fingers, and it'll, like, snap you into reality and be like, oh, wait, like, I'm in a dream right now. This I is guess crazy. it's Inception right now, yeah, dude. Yeah, you get like your inception. dreidel, you just spin it. So it never stops. If you, one of the ways is, like, reading script that you see in, like, the real world and, like, looking away and reading it again, because if you do that in the dream, it'll change. Um, and, like, that kind of, like, helps me in a way, like, because I've been doing that a lot, like just reading like people's shirts and then looking back and reading them again or like signs. And it really helps you just like be like in the moment. Like you're like thinking about like what you're doing. Like you're not just like a lot of times I feel like people just are on autopilot, just kind of like sending it, like put their headphones in, go to class, like blah, blah, blah. It's like type out all your notes. I right, go to the next class, like put your headphones in, like walk there. Like, okay, I'll probably eat now. Like, leave your headphones in, like, watch a YouTube video while you're eating, like, shovel a bunch of food down, then go back and then do homework. I'm like, thinking about what I'm doing next like, rather than what I'm are, doing right now. People are on, like, autopilot for a lot of a lot of their days. And, like, yeah, it's good when you have a lot of work to do. you got to be on schedule and stuff like that. But, like, you can still be cognizant of the fact that, like, this is, like, your reality right now. Like, this is the present moment. Just, like, be in the moment and, like, be aware of the fact that, like, Life is not, like, a rocket ship that goes from, like, zero to a hundred. Like, it's a long, long thing. Like, you can be aware of the fact that... The crazy part about this, though, is kind of, like, you are working towards the future, so therefore in the moment you sacrifice. So you're mm-hmm. sacrificing the moment so that your future will be better. Yeah. And it's tough because it's like, well, if I just live in the moment, then I would do things that maybe aren't beneficial for my future, but they're going to be beneficial right now. And it's, well, I just mean more, no, no, just more in the sense that like, just be aware, like, even like you're saying, like walk in a class that your headphones yeah. in, like, just like be aware of that. Like, just, just take a second to like slow down. Just breathe like, it in, man. Breathe, man. <laughs> just be like, you yeah. know, stop and stop and check out the flowers yeah. every once in a while, man. Yeah, yeah. Check out the flowers for sure. <laughs> yeah. Read a book. Read a book. Take a deep breath. These get degrees, but people that read books during all that time they're spending not doing their homework are the real ones who are winning. Well, exactly. It goes back to, um, I saw this thing. It's like the average millionaire has like a GPA, like a 2.9. It's like Mm -hmm. high GPAs don't really reflect anything. It's because most smart people know to just get the degree done so they can just get their foot in their door and realize most companies, it's like if you're really smart, Mm -hmm. you can drop out. You get most people, if you're like wicked intelligent, Who's the kid that went to school here and he was, like, president of, like, the 
club and he had like a one nine, but he was such a good thing for UMass. They just let him keep coming to class. And he would like walk around reading oh, books yeah, all the time. Yeah. Um, kid's like an urban legend. Yeah. Oh yeah. He was like one of the old, um, investment club leaders. He was like, he would just like never go to class cause he was doing so much research and stuff on his own time and like investing on his own time. It's like, you can he's like, he's a super smart dude. All the Harvard classes. It's like, they put all the Harvard classes online for free for you to watch. So you can get like a Harvard education just by watching a bunch of videos. It's mm-hmm. like, you don't get the piece of paper, but I guarantee if you're smart enough and you watch all that stuff and you took the notes, it, you're, you, you'd learn everything that they're learning. It's not like yeah. they have like it's like harvard really they just inject you with a chip and they give you the information and you're like well, you're not even there for four years it's just yeah. like you're in the matrix and you're like all right all right you're good now it's like what do you do that, that's the secret to ivy league yeah. schools you don't even learn they, they just give the you a secret sigil it's like and dude. they like they give you a little brand on your back and then they insert the chip in your head and you it's like, know the secrets of the world it's like you're a genius now yeah but i don't know college is again it's it's the more everyone talks to now. It's kind of like we're, it's funny nah, too. It's cool, yeah. It's just, I like it. Yeah, it's a great time, but it's which we don't we didn't learn That's anything. You get like, out of it. Didn't learn anything from class. Still don't learn anything. From class. I mean, so I think some people go to college, they don't get a job, but the lessons they learned while at college are like worth it for them. So well, it's, it's not all about like getting jobs, you know. Well, that's why, but that's the problem is it's like, I needed a degree for a job, but that's mm-hmm. literally why we're here for the job. If it wasn't about getting jobs and like, it'd actually be better if it was, if you, if college was pushed as, Hey, this is not necessary, but it's good for life lessons. And like, Hey, yeah. it just like a little boost and be like, okay. But the problem is it's pushed as I need this. This is like, if you don't have a degree, you cannot. And that's a lot of thing. The older generations too. It's like, they don't realize you try and tell them like, Oh, I'm going to drop out and be a podcaster. I have a million. They're like, what? You're not going to get a degree. You could never do that. Like, like my grandparents, they don't know what Instagram is. They'd be like, I tried to show them a video of someone being famous for doing something stupid. They'd be like, what the hell is that kid? They're like, yeah. he have, what's his degree? And it's like, um, Steve will do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, what is this guy doing? Like this kid's going to die. This kid posts memes and makes a million dollars a year. <laughs> Wait, what? That's gotta be the life right there. It's gotta be life. But... Dude, I have a million followers on my meme page. Mom, don't talk to me like that. It's like, I'm yo, doing my homework. Fire festival. It's like, dude, I just scam people. Okay. Like yeah. I just scam rich white people in America to buy fake tickets. I post videos on Instagram of me with models. And then they're like, yo, that guy's got the life. Do I got the life? I don't know. It's all a scam, but there's more to life than models and bottles, too. Yeah, right, dude. (laughs) You're not in the right class, dude. You're not in the right clubs. Yeah. All right, well. Yeah, well. What are we at right now? That was pretty good. We're at an hour 40, so yeah. I'm getting uh, ready to end this podcast. Uh, Jack, anything you want to close the folks out with? Um... Read more books. <laughs> I'm going to read 52 books in 2019. Everyone's got to hold me to it. Hold them to it. Every week, better be posting. And that means any week you don't do it, you got to read two. Any Dude, week. I got, that was like my least liked post on Instagram. <laughs> no yeah. one liked it. You deleted the post. You didn't get enough likes. <laughs> yeah. I, no one cares about what books I've been, I've been reading. If you're smart, you just make everything a video. That way, no one sees the likes. They just see the views. And you're like, yeah. yeah, everyone saw it, man. No one's liking it, though. It's like, yeah, yeah that's, that's, a, that's a scam. <laughs> Is that the key to Instagram? That's the key to Instagram. Only video. Just, post it as, just post it as a boomerang. Dude, people take Instagram way too seriously, man. People take social media way too seriously. That's true. But we don't take life seriously. We don't take the real connections, the simple things in life, man. It's the simple things. Yeah, that's what it's all about, bro. But yeah. Um, yeah, so obviously we'll have Jack on more. Intelligent guy. Funny guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, again. Uh, nice. uh, tell your mom you love her. It's always. Tell your girlfriend she's pretty. Tell your uh, friends that they're happy to be in your life. Call and your grandma. <laughs> call your grandma. And uh, yeah, age for assholes. It's these, these get the breeze. And uh, non copyright music. Play so. <laughs> yeah, college.
but mankind won't be destroyed. The fact that you and I are working here.